hello. Had a little computer problems today, but we got them licked. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless all who come in tonight. I ask you to guide us through the knowledge of your truth, what you would like us to know about these things that James wrote. I ask you to be with us. We ask you to be Lord over this computer. I don't know what happened to it over the weekend, but it's aggravating. I ask you to bless us, Father, and allow us to fully populate everything you want us to do and teach us what you would like us to know in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joy. Hey, Jennifer. Sorry I'm late. I was. I had to reboot the computer at the last minute because it wasn't behaving. <clears throat> okay. We're in... James chapter 1, verse 11. Um, what's happened so far is that I want, to, I want to go back a verse and I'm trying to look up um, where we were. So, so he's talking about the stresses. In verse uh, 9, he says, well, let me go back to see verse 8. He said in verse 9, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. And what he means by that is people, hey Gary, who aren't um, important in the eyes of the world. Let him glory in his exaltation. Um, the word exaltation means to be lifted to an elevated place. So, so God is going to lift us no matter how low we are in the eyes of others into an elevated place. And then in verse 10 he said, but let the rich in his humiliation, let him glory in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. And so um, I thought it was important that we go back over those because of what he's fixing to say, what he's about to say. He says in verse 11, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, <clears throat> its flowers falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. Now what happens in this world is that if you have more stuff, if your clothes and vehicle and house and things like that seem to be um, the best ever, then for some reason um, you are supposed to be preferred and maybe even held up as a standard of what we could all be like if we were blessed like this person. Um, but what he says is these things have seasons. Now when he writes this, he says, so the rich man will also will fade away in his pursuits. That he's going to have a season and that season is going to come and go. Now as he writes this, to these Jews who are Christians, who are, are, are um, scattered all over the place because of the persecution of the Jews, mostly by um, Jewish Christians, by the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, um, he quotes from Isaiah a verse that will be um, well known by these people. And this comes out of Isaiah 40 verses 6 through 8. The voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? And this is what the voice says to cry out. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower, flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So when he quotes this verse, it brings the hope of the end of that verse. The word of our God stands forever. So James describes something which is familiar to these people living in the Middle East. During the cool night, colorful desert flowers bloom, but when the sun rises, they die suddenly. And it's not the sun which does this, it's the burning wind, which is called simum, S-I-M-O-O-M which I had never heard before, and I'm pretty well read. So that was kind of cool um, to hear a new word. Simum. 
but it's it's something that if we lived back there, back then, we would know what the simum was, which begins as the sun rises. And what it does is it consumes all the flowers and all the tender green grasses of the fields. We were driving through New Mexico once. We had gone to the southwest corner to a place called Silver City, and we were driving back to Albuquerque, and as we were driving along, everybody else in the car was sound asleep. So at the time, we had one baby son. Our oldest boy was in a car seat. My mother-in-law and Laurie were in the back, and my father-in-law was in the front seat. Everybody was knocked out but me. Um, and I'm driving along, and there's these things called arroyos, and arroyos are like, um, they're like uh, deltas from when the rain's up on the mountains. It washes down these, these little valleys. And what had happened during the night, well, my father-in-law woke up a bit, and he, he looked around, and he said, this land ain't good for nothing. Because it was just brown, and it was barren. It was, you know, deserty. Um, but there's a lot of life in the desert if you look for it. And I'll never forget this. What, what had happened was apparently during the night or early morning, it had rained, and the water washed down there, and there are desert plants which are just sitting there. The seeds are sitting there idling, waiting for water. And it had rained, and the whole arroyo was just a carpet of multicolored, beautiful yellows, pinks, reds, all kinds of colors. It was gorgeous and very, very much alive. And what was going to happen was throughout the day, those plants were going to go through a life cycle. And then they were going to pass away. But I saw it even as a young Christian, because I was saved right before then. Um, I saw it as a gift from the Lord to, hey, Lynn, to show the life that was in a place that seemed to have no life. And so I thought that was beautiful. I thought it was something worth seeing. And, and these people, when he talks about it and he quotes Isaiah, they know what he's talking about. Um, and they can take that and go, okay, I get what God's saying through James. He's warning the wealthy, scattered Jewish Christians to not trust in their wealth because that can go away in an instant. So imagine being in this situation. They're fairly new Christians. They're far from the leaders they had to leave behind in Jerusalem as they fled persecution. <clears throat> far from accountability from, um, to Christian men and women. They might feel as if they're at the mercy of strangers. Can you sense their vulnerability? You know, there. If you, if you, and remember, hey, hey, uh, I can see the Jonathan and Holly. Hi there, Hope Church. Um, Hope Church, great little place. If you ever want to go visit a place, that's a good place to visit. On uh, Highway 407, just east of 287 in Rome, Texas. Sometimes I speak there. Um, the fairly new Christians, and they're, you know, they're in a place that they don't know. Uh, and then they're not known. And so the, the uh, poorer ones might feel real vulnerable. The richer ones might too. Remember we read, uh, it might have been last week or the week before, this also coincided with a famine. And in a famine, it really doesn't matter how rich you are if people won't sell you food. And so they're pretty vulnerable. And remember we saw that the church was making collections and sending them out to other uh, Christians that were suffering in the famine. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what's happening inside them. And he uses James to equip them in their time of need, even far from what I call the brain trust for Christianity there in Jerusalem. They're in an excellent position from the devil's perspective to be tempted to sin. Therefore, James addresses that topic. In verse 12, James 1, 12, he says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, James describes the situation they're in if they're being tempted as one, is, as one of being blessed. 
which is a Greek word, makarios, M-A-K-A with a accent mark on it, R-I-O-S, makarios. And this word is rich in meaning. And while it's often trans uh, translated as happy, it means something deeper than happy. Happy refers to a person who is pleased at how lucky they've been. In fact, just pause just for a second. Have you noticed how many of our brothers and sisters have what I call situational faith? As long as everything's gone their way, God is great. You know, and, and everything's great. But when everything's not exactly their way, the face is a downcast, everything's falling apart, uh, nothing's good, everything stinks. And it's because their faith is based on the situation of um, plenty. When everything is okay, when I have what I need, then yay God. And if I don't, then it's like I'm not born again anymore. You know, have you noticed this? Or am I the only one that gets to see this from my perspective? I think others have seen it too. So happy refers to someone who is pleased at how lucky he's been or how fortunate or how uh, they're getting what they want. All right? Are y'all hearing me okay? It looks like I'm doing okay, but I, I can't gauge if you can hear me. So if I am, say something. I've actually had times when I've done 15 minutes and nobody said that they couldn't hear what I was saying. Um, so hopefully you're hearing what I'm saying. The word blessed is much deeper. Thank you, Hope Church. Um, is much deeper. The word blessed means possessing the favor of God, that state of being marked by fullness from God. And you know, other people might not see it. It's good. Thank you. Um, other people might not see if we're blessed, but we sense the fullness of God inside. And that definition of blessed, um, which I can post here, if I can get to page 26. Page 26. Um, no, 27. Um, so I'm going to quote that. And this comes out of one of the resources that I love to use, the Complete Word Study Dictionary, uh, which you can actually get and put in your in your um, library at home. It's um, it's an expensive book that's worth every penny. Um, worth every penny. So James describes them as being blessed. As possess, he says, "Blessed is the man." Um, the man who endures temptation, in other words, is possessing the favor of God, the state, if he endures, um, the state of being marked by the fullness from God. Now, why would James say this? Hey, Liz. Why would, why would um, James say this to these people? Why would he say this about being tempted? And remember, the word temptation is one which refers to the purification process. What he's doing is he's, he is extending a concept to them which has to do with what the Holy Spirit, what happens in the Holy Spirit when we resist temptation. Actually, he says, blessed is the man who endures it, who remains under it. This is more than just resisting temptation. When we endure temptation, we resist the craving to cut and run away from the situation, which is always one of our options. To endure temptation means to remain motionless, choosing to remain pure rather than run away from the opportunity to sin. To do this reveals that the focus of the one tempted has moved from a focus on the object of temptation to a focus on the Lord and his ways. So I'm going to post that in here because I think it, it says something. And for the person who endures temptation, it reveals this. I'm going to post it in the study. 
so that you can see it and, and hopefully that makes it easier to meditate on these things. To do this reveals that the focus of the person being tempted, hey Sandra, that the focus of the one being tempted has moved from being focused on whatever Satan is holding out to us to try to lure us into the temptation. It's moved from looking at that to focusing on the Lord while being tempted. So we're not going to roll around in whatever Satan is trying to put out there. Does that make sense? Um, and so... So while it's true that we could just cut and run from it, and I think what the Bible definitely says to flee immorality, and that is one of our options, but the fact is you can't go anywhere on the planet. You can't actually flee temptation. Even Jesus experienced it in the wilderness. So Satan's going to do what he does, and he's just going to go on autopilot doing what he does. But what do we do with that? If the temptation comes and I just sit there lusting after whatever it is, and it could be as bad as a sexually immoral idea or an opportunity to to a donut, you know, it could be whatever it is that we know we're not supposed to practice or do, you know. What are we going to do? Are we going to meditate on the object? Or are we going to look up to God? Submit to the God, therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yeah, therefore we don't have to. And frankly, what I believe happens is that Satan, who has limited resources, you know, um, he, he's not God, he doesn't know all things, he's not all powerful, he's not in control of our lives unless we let him be in control of our lives. Um, if you resist the devil, he is going to see, and we'll get into that deeper when we get to you know, chapter 4, maybe 100 years. Um, um, if, we, if he throws out his best stuff and it's not working on us, he's going to move along. He's not going to waste his time and energy. You know, he's not going to waste his time and energy on us if it isn't working. Faith. Is what is what James is talking about. Blessed is the man who who endures temptation, who who sets his he entrusts himself to the Lord when he's aware that Satan is trying to do something, right? So that's why that's why uh, we're looking at it this way. Hey, Dave, Paulus, it's good to see you. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. For when he has been approved. The trial process has to do with stress, like extreme heat being applied to the metals so that impurities can be removed. When metals are finished, when they finish being tried, think temptation, when the metals are finished being tried, they're going to be evaluated. And the one evaluating then proclaims the metal to be approved or declared to be purified and therefore worthy of being utilized for its intended purpose. Satan thinks he can run the show in our life and surely if we let him, he will. He will take advantage of our foolishness or our ignorance, or our lack of vigilance. But God, who watches the temptation happen, chooses to allow us to go through it so that we may be purified, so that we may be approved, taking what Satan means for evil, turning it to our good, so that he can take the purified, less encumbered version of us and apply us to the task that he always and forever knew he had set aside just for you or just for me. Isn't that beautiful? So it's like the spiritual jujitsu move that Jesus does to um, to cause us to, to be better suited for the works that he has for us. This is why the scripture teaches in one of the letters to Timothy uh, to not lay hands on people quickly 
to put them in places of authority or high influence because it takes time to be purified. And this is why so many in the body of Christ have fallen after this, you know, this fantastic blast off to some kind of man-made pinnacle of, of, um, of um, some kind of achievement in the body of Christ and then they fall over because they haven't had a chance for those impurities to be burned away. So they're easy pickings for their enemy. There's also this man-made concept that the higher up in the structure you get, the, the less uh, able you are to confess your sins to one another because you owe it to people to appear to be perfect. And I just don't believe that's a biblical concept at all. It really doesn't matter what people think about us. Of course, I like it when Laurie approves of me. But what really matters is that he approves of me. That's what matters for you. It doesn't really matter what somebody else notices is good or bad about you, but what God does, what he thinks about who you are, and he loves you, and he thinks you're the bee's knees, right? So that's, that's what I think we should focus on. So the trial process has to do with bringing us to the place of being approved. For when he has been approved, so blessed is a man who endures temptation, because when he has improved, uh, been approved, he's going to receive something. He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. Being approved gains us an incredible honor. We receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now this idea of the crown of life is an interesting concept which is mentioned several, t several times in the New Testament. So I went and did some research on this. And sometimes it's mentioned, there's, ver there's various names for it, it's pretty interesting. Um, the crown of joy, the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory. And all of these, all of which are associated with being born again into the family of God. Give you a couple of verses. Second Timothy four, seven through eight says this I have fought the good fight. Let me let me um quote that. This was interesting to me because it challenged some things that um, I've been taught that I'm not sure will correct. Um, and I think it's, we, we really need to be, we really need to be um, aware that some of the stuff that we've been taught isn't true. And, and that we always be open for God to show us something different. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, Paul says this, I fought the good fight I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have, who have loved his appearing, which I think just is a delicious way of saying how much we... Isn't that pretty? The, 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 um, who have loved... Jesus is appearing. I just, that really caught my eye. And there's another one in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and 25. Do you not know that those who run the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who completes the prize is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. In Revelations 2.10, Jesus speaks to John in a vision of Christians being tested in various trials, and he ends the verse, Revelation 2.10, like this, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
When we're born again, we were transferred from spiritual death into the life of God, which is what the word zoe means. It refers to spirit life, or sometimes I'll say life that flows from heaven through the Holy Spirit who indwells our human spirits and is in us, deep inside us, and can affect our souls if we allow God to uh, pierce the divide between soul and spirit with his uh, rhema word. Um, virtually every time we see the word life in the New Testament, it's referring to the sort of heavenly derived life as opposed to earthly life by us, which is just life on the earth. So we get Zoe in our human spirits when we are saved. In James 1, 12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The idea of receiving a crown, though, is different. The Greek word for crown is stephanos, like Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. It, it was most used in the first century to describe the crown, a victor who in games like the Olympics of their time um, would wear. I need to fix that sentence. It is also given to people to signify their civic worth or military accomplishments. And these things were woven of oak, uh, ivory, I mean not ivory, ivy, myrtle, olive leaves, or flowers, not metal crowns like we envision when we hear the word crowns. We receive Zoe life as a gift at the moment we're born again, a crown of life. However, a crown of life, however, is granted as a part of being a child of God who lives it out. Every reference to the crown of life that I could find in the New Testament was preceded by faithfulness and endurance and godly performance. Now, this isn't a matter of performance for performance sake. Rather, it has to do with how we live and perform under pressure, coinciding with who we are in Christ. It's so important that we learn our identities in Christ, that we become aware of the big change that happened the second we were saved, the instant that we were born again. We took on a new heavenly identity, which was uh, linked completely to Jesus and not completely to our earthly family or our race or our skin color or our nation of origin any of that stuff it came it comes from God and so we have a new me each of us has a new me that's based on what God has done not on what we have done good or bad we have a new identity and that new identity comes with it behaviors that bring health because and the reason they bring health I'm not talking about obeying God so that other people will think we're amazing Christians. I'm talking about obeying God because this is who we are. I'm not talking about refusing to cheat in taxes or whatever it is because someone will, will be amazed by the fact that we didn't cheat. I'm talking about the fact that it has to do this is right for me because I have been remade into the image and likeness of Christ and my identity goes all the way back to the throne in heaven through Christ and through the Holy Spirit which indwells me. It's much deeper than performing so other people will see the performance. It's not that kind of performance. It has to do, maybe performing is not a good idea, a, a good word for me to use here, but it has to do with lifestyle and, and, and walking out who we are eternally. We're not going to have to worry about these things when we get to heaven because the, all these temptations will be gone. But right now we're in it and we have to decide how are we going to go through it. Are we going to go through it with a checklist of rules? 
Are we going to go through it constantly being paranoid that someone's going to see us doing something wrong or constantly paranoid someone will see us doing something right will give us that thumbs up from somebody who is no more important than we are? Or are we going to live out who we are? Are we going to enjoy being new creations in Christ? It's totally different. So every reference to this, before every reference to this, was, was stuff about the faithfulness and endurance and godly performance of the people who received the, the crown of life. It's not a matter of performance for performance sake. And as I did my research on this passage in James, I stumbled across an interesting take on the doctrine of crowns as it's commonly taught in the Western Church, the institutional church. And often this carries into uh, house church and organic church or whatever, however you want to say it. Because we're, have you noticed that what we leave, if we flee, let's say we flee institutional church and we're going to go for what we think is superior, which might be home churches or whatever. If we flee institutional church, our focus is on what we're leaving and some of the things that characterize whatever we flee will pollute whatever we do next. This is the reason there's so many denominations that look so much alike. There's an alternative. And, and I'm not talking about bad institution, good home church. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about human, how, how human we are. And what I want to propose is that we don't flee anything like that. Let's not leave something. Let's move towards whatever God is drawing us to. I don't want to be obsessed with what I don't do. <laughs> you know, because it'll color what I do do. And yes, I said do do. Uh, whatever it is that I do function in, that's what's important. So I want to be drawn towards what the Lord has drawn me to. And everybody's is going to be a little bit different because we are different. So I did some studies and I looked in the complete um, word dictionary. And I'm going to paste from this because I think it's so rich. And, and I'm going to have it there so that people can see it if they want to see it. And this and this. Now, this is written by a Greek theologian who speaks Greek in everyday life, and Spiro Zodiades. And, and he was addressing what he could see. And I don't think he's taken liberties with anything. He says, The popular doctrine that the five crowns mentioned in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9.25, incorruptible crown, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, crown of joy. 2 Timothy 4.8, crown of righteousness. James 1.12, crown of life. 1 Peter 5.4, crown of glory. He says, the popular doctrine that these five crowns mentioned in the New Testament refer to the five separate rewards which believers may earn as a gross misinterpretation of Scripture and fraught, that's a good word, fraught, with many th theological problems. The next paragraph, and I'm pasting this from my Bible study so that it'll be here and other people can look at it if they want to. First of all, the figure of the crown in 1 Thessalonians 2.19 is quite different from that in view in the other passages. Here Paul has in mind the custom of cities preparing wreaths a various material, olive, ivy, oak, beaten gold, in anticipation of the arrival of high-ranking dignitaries. These wreaths were either worn on the body or clothing or strewn about the streets. They were emblems of joy and expressions of devotion given by the people to the visiting official. As such, the Thessalonian converts are analogous to these wreaths and represent not what Christ will give to God, but what Paul will offer the Christ in joyous tribute to him 
when Jesus returns. So it's, it's a whole different idea. This is, I think, rich what uh, is written in this, this Bible dictionary. And I rarely quote this much from somewhere else. Secondly, the crowns of life and righteousness are promised respectively to those who love Christ and his appearing. Such persons are not a special class of believers, but represent all true Christians. I mean, we've heard sermons about behave so that well, so that God will give you crowns because you you was, did something special, and then you have you know, I don't know, extra honor. Um, such persons are not a special class of believers, but represent all true Christians. The expression "those who love Him" is just another and descriptive name for believers that's commonly used in Scripture, and then there's the Scriptures. Uh, that they use it in. And, and so you have it in the Greek, and then you have it in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament in Exodus 20, verse 6, Psalm 9, 7, 10, and so on. And so this is a common expression in the scriptures. The expression... I'm so pleased that the Lord blessed my computer to start working because it was messed up. I rebooted right before I came on. Um, the expression, those who love is appearing, serves to distinguish the saved from the unsaved. In Hebrews 9, 28, he shall appear a second time for salvation apart from him for those who eagerly await him. Those, that's us. Those who love his appearing. I don't know about you, but I seem to see a lot of people on Facebook right now who are saying they're ready for him to show up because things are getting tough. And thirdly, the various designation of the crowns are cons consisting of righteousness, life, and glory are simply intended to highlight different facets of the same thing. To make these separate items introduces an unnecessary complexity to the matter and only creates confusion. And there he's talking about the popular doctrines um, that have that are misinterpretation of misinterpretation of scripture and fraught with theological problems. The, he says these uh, introduce unnecessary complexity to the matter and create confusion. This is not to deny the biblical teaching of rewards, but only to say that these passages don't even touch on that issue. They're misinterpreted. And that's, that's what you find um, often as people um, become so studious that they overstudy something. So in James 1.12 again, and I'm going to go a little bit late because I started five minutes late uh, because of my computer issues. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James goes on in his letter, going deeper into explaining, and this to me is worth the whole book of James, um, but the whole book of James is worth the whole book of James, you know. Let no one, he explains how temptation happens, which I ask people this all the time. Well, how, do, how does temptation happen? He says, Net, and this is in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor do, does he himself tempt anyone. Now, the word tempted is a Greek word which has to do with Satan trying to lure us into sinning. God allows this, but he never tempts us to sin. He doesn't play those games with us because he loves us and because it's not in his nature to encourage anyone to sin. And that's why James says, let no one says when he's tempted that I am tempted by God. Now some of us have, have or have had parents or other authority figures 
who would lay traps for us to keep us always off balance. Our Heavenly Father is not like that. James explains why we should never say God, God tempted us. As he does so, he gives a hint into how temptation works. He says, God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. There is a process to temptation. And it's worth our while to ponder how this works. In Matthew 10, 16, Jesus tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And the word serpents is a reference to demons. When Satan was cast out of heaven, he took one third of the angels with him who willingly joined in his rebellion. And you can see that in Revelations 12, 4. The word angel means messenger. And these are what we call fallen angels. And because they're fallen and not pure like the ones who remained with the Lord, um, the messages they carry are not from God, but from Satan. This is what temptation is. Messages from Satan to people. He wants to gain ground in human souls. And if we let him, he'll do it to us. James tells us that God cannot be tempted by evil. That word evil is a Greek word, kakos, K-A-K-O-S, or kakos. And it means depri deprived and injur injurious. So God cannot be tempted by anything Satan puts out, all of which is depri depraved, not deprived, I'm sorry, depraved and injurious. He loves to hurt. He loves to hurt people. In John 10, 10a, Jesus said, the thief, referring to Satan, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, Satan's hope is that he not only successfully tempt us, but to go on to tempt someone else, that we would go on to tempt something else so he doesn't even waste any energy doing it himself. That's why James said what he said this way. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor can he himself tempt anyone. Not only can Satan not successfully tempt God, but God certainly won't be doing the devil's work for him. Now, when we're tempted and we bring that temptation to others, we are doing Satan's work. James continues to explain how temptation works in a human soul. Again, we see a process at work, and the process starts long before Satan dispatches a demon with the temptation. He observes us, and we reveal to him what it is that we lust to have. And we're going to stop for this week right there because um, we're going to run out of time. But that's what we're going to talk about next time. Now, speaking of next time... I'm not positive what my Monday's going to look like next time or if I'm going to have access, um, if I'm going to be able to. i got some, something coming up, and um, I'm not sure if I'll have access uh, to the net to teach. So I, I'm bringing my materials. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to, but um, I'll try. It all depends on the circumstances. Either way, I'll be posting online so you'll know. Um, so you'll know if I'm going to be able to or not. I'm going to post a couple of, couple of links. Uh, we're going to pray in a minute. And after we pray, uh, we'll be done. Um, and I'll post these links. Um, so let's close right now. Father, I thank you for this Bible study. I thank you for people who... who um, take the time in their life to be a part of this Bible study. And not just now, but the ones who view it on YouTube later, view it on Facebook later, and even take the time to comment on it and take the time to tell other people about it. And it just is uh, humbling to know that people care that much. So I thank you for that. I thank you for their hunger to learn um, more about the scriptures and more about who they are 
more about Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. And I just thank you for that, that you put that craving inside people who follow you. I ask you to awaken in those who just don't seem to care about the Scriptures a hunger for that. Because when it's all said and done, what all, the only thing that really matters is you. I ask you to bless each of these. I ask you to keep them well. Uh, Father, we do. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for Russia to make wise decisions and to stop hurting innocent people. And I ask you to to um, to reveal what needs to be revealed about it all. There's plenty of ideas about that, and all that really matters is the truth. So I ask you to do that, Father. I ask you to um, continue to bless us in our health. And I praise you for these things, and thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Joe, I'm actually doing pretty good. Um, uh, I've been having some kidney issues. My kidney function has improved. It was fun to see my kidney doctor completely wake out when he realized that. Um, but my kidney function is out of the danger zone right now, not far enough out of it. So we're hoping for continued recovery uh, through prayer. I believe I, um, I know why my kidneys were beginning to fail. And hey, Kenneth, I'm glad you were here. Um, um, I, I uh, think I know why. I think it was um, had to do with a chemical test that I had to go through in December. And so it looks like we're on top of things. There's going to be some other stuff happening, and we'll be sending out reports on that. Um, so a doctor today who wants to do something else. So, um, you know, sometimes batteries run out on our parts and need to, need to be revamped. But all in all, I have more energy. I performed a wedding this weekend, and all the stresses and, and tiredness of that, and, and um, it was good. It was really a good time. And uh, it was great seeing some friends. I want to remind you, it's interesting to me how you can make, build a relationship 15 or 20 years ago, and it results in you doing that person's daughter's wedding. You know, <laughs> 15 years or 10 years later, whatever it was, man, it's so cool the way God sets things up and, and connections with people that I did, uh, that family I was able to do two funerals for him, and now a wedding, connecting with her, uh, the woman's um, siblings, and and um, just so cool to be able to serve. And uh, all I wanted to do was somebody brought me to a, a um, antique store, and said you need to meet this lady, and I did, and it's resulted in all this. It's just follow God, you know, and keep your eye open, eyes open. It's just amazing to me how God works in relationships. He just loves relationships, and he operates in those. Um, this is my link on my website for where all these videos uh, eventually go to YouTube. Um, and so um, you can find last times there. Um, if you're a reader, if you're not, ask God to make you one. I think reading is awesome. Um, there's a bunch of articles, over 260, I think, articles there, um, a few by other people, mostly uh, through God wrote those through me, and I appreciate it. And then uh, there's my YouTube channel. Um, the way I work this is I do the teaching, go home, spend time with Laurie, and then um, when she begins winding down, I download it from YouTube, upload it I'm from Facebook, upload it to YouTube, and then we have redundancy. And so if one goes away, the other one's still there. And it's just it's just cool uh, that we can do this. I have every one of these videos on my website. Um, I mean on my, um, yeah, on my on the YouTube, but actually on my computer. I keep all these things. So, and there are people in other parts of the country that are, um, and all across the world, that are watching our videos. So pray for opportunities for yourselves for the other people in these Bible studies, for Laurie and I, and uh, pray for our health and our endurance. Uh, we're doing pretty good. I feel pretty good today. God bless y'all. Uh, my, my operation is healing, and um, my hand's a little bit swollen, um, but we're getting there. We're better off than we were two days ago. Love you guys. I'll see you next time. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this. Good night.
I love y'all. Bye.